Hello. My name is Sharbal Laun, and I am the managing director of AI City in NVIDIA and a board member of Future Cities Catapult. Uh, I am here today asked, invited, and grateful for the opportunity to chair a two-hour session with an amazing panel and group of speakers that will discuss data-driven cities and the cloud, making the most of data in a multimodal cloud world. Digitization is making datafication a reality. What became evident today is the value is not in digital, but in the data that is enabled by digitization. That will give us the insight and allow us to do things that were not possible before ushering the days of the data economy. The line between physical and digital and virtual are blurring, and in the process unearthing massive opportunities and innovation, and cities are accordingly adjusting with a focus on how such a digital transformation can affect their interaction with citizens and how can cities better service their citizens. To cope with the new world, new skills are required. Such skills cities historically did not need to acquire. The emergence of chief data officers or equivalent in the administrative hierarchy of cities is a good indicator of the recent importance given to the data and its potential benefit. Today, this data can be analyzed in real time or near real time, converted from raw data, from raw format, into information, into a value. Now, when integrated with people and processes and other system, they allow better decision-making process, better operation optimization, change in the service model, and creating new business models that we're seeing today emerging in cities and other industries. Data never sleeps. Our cities are collecting data 24-7, one way or the other. This new reality is accelerated and made possible due to some trends and te technological changes that we will discuss on this panel. Now, it is predicted that the cost of hardware or technology products will be zero, which means the value is shifting from the product into the data and the value and the information derived from the product. And this is the data economy era. And that's a question mark, and that's a prediction, and that's, there is evidence in the market of this is happening. Connectivity is becoming pervasive. All devices are gradually being connected and getting an address on the internet. Over time, they will have identity, digital twin and they will be able to communicate to each other directly and exchanging data relevant to the time and the context of the event. We all heard about Moore's law. It's dead. So how are we gonna power the next 30 years of high compute power that we require? Luckily, we have a lot of acceleration happening and then we're funneling and then powering the next 30 years of power compute because it's about big data. And if we want to manage big data, we need accelerated compute as an affordable cost. Now, as technology is advancing exponentially, there are three mega trends driving this. And cities are heavily affected by this. The number one is uh, the IoT. As we talk about the IoT, the Internet of Things, and we talk about it because it has the ability of providing sensing. There are a lot of advancement in the sensing technology. They're getting smaller, they're getting connected, they're providing more and more and more data. Mobility. With the number of devices connected to the Internet, IoT objects and users, now IoT devices come with a connectivity embedded as an integral part. And they're coming all with some form of an API on application to facilitate the interaction between device and user, device and another device. Cloud. When talking about large scale IoT, without the cloud, it is a nightmare to manage the flow and storage of data, and even I would say it's impossible. This in turn enables the big data. And when we have the big data, which is the second trend, big trend, this is where we can start deriving value. We moved in analytics from machine learning to deep learning, and we're seeing today the new era, the next 30 years, where software will be writing software, 
machines will be coding and generating solutions that humans were not able to do before. And the third mega trend, of course, I talk about is the AI. Now, all this is something we're going to debate in the next two hours. I would love you if you pull out your smartphone, download the app. At the bottom of the app, you have ask and vote. During the session, put forward anonymously. Don't worry about your privacy. Your questions, don't be shy. If you don't want to put a question, you can vote on the question, and you can push it up to the top. And I will try my best to ask our esteemed panel this. For the purpose of debating that topic, the datafication and the cloud, I'm going to start the two hours with our esteemed panel. I would like to invite the mayor of Santander, Mayor Gemma Igual Ortiz, along with the NEC Iberica CEO, Mr. Jaime Serrano. Please come on, on stage. And they will share with us their insight. I can tell you. We're ready. All right. Mayor. to balance. Can you hear me? Better? Okay. All right. Like everything else, especially in cities, resources are limited. How do you balance with the limited resources and the long list of things to do and the interests of the people, how do you make a choice choosing where to make your bet? Bueno, pues muy buenos días. Muchísimas gracias en primer lugar por darnos la oportunidad de hablar de la ciudad de Santander y de nuestro modelo eh, Smart City que realmente tantos beneficios y tanto ha cambiado la ciudad. Y es cierto que una ciudad, pues eh, debemos de ajustarnos a los presupuestos municipales y debemos de ajustarnos también a, a ese documento eh, que tenemos y que es en qué nos debemos gastar el dinero. Pero también es cierto que hay que ser proactivos y hay que buscar ayuda y hay que buscar dinero en otros estamentos como puede ser la Unión Europea, que para nosotros, que para Santander Smart City, pues tanta importancia tuvo. Santander es una ciudad eh, que en el año 2008 empezamos eh, pues a, a tener la inquietud del cambio, el cambio sobre todo por la crisis económica que estaba sufriendo España y en donde lo primero debe, eh, pues estuvimos pensando, estuvimos analizando las fortalezas, las debilidades y las oportunidades de una ciudad de 170.000 habitantes al norte del norte del sector servicios y que, eh, que en ese plan estratégico 2010-2020 nos marcó eh, los dos pilares fundamentales de desarrollo a futuro, que fueron la innovación y la cultura. Por eso digo que para priorizar esfuerzos, lo primero hay que eh, planificar. Después, una vez ya conocido que la innovación era una oportunidad para, para la ciudad de Santander, pues de cada euro que han invertido los santanderinos han sido más de tres, casi cuatro, los euros eh, que se ha revertido en el proyecto Smart Santander. Y con eso nos ha dado pues, oportunidades de futuro para empresarios, para empresas del sector de las tecnologías. Está aquí el presidente de Ascentic, de la Asociación de Empresas de Nuevas Tecnologías, que es el único sector que en nuestra ciudad no tiene paro. Tenemos ahora un programa con el ayuntamiento en el que, como necesitan pues, eh, unos trabajadores pues, cada vez más multidisciplinar, el ayuntamiento les forma y luego ellos, mediante prácticas, aseguran un elevado puestos de trabajo, con lo cual en eso ha cambiado mucho la ciudad, en oportunidad de trabajo para nuestros jóvenes o en oportunidad también de reciclaje laboral para muchos de los santanderinos. Ha cambiado en el concepto de ciudad de cara al exterior, porque debemos de tener en cuenta que fruto de que hoy estemos aquí o fruto de que ayer teníamos una delegación coreana en la ciudad de Santander, pues es también el trabajo que llevamos haciendo en, en innovación y sobre todo para los santanderinos. Para los santanderinos ha cambiado porque hoy 
con la introducción de la tecnología la ciudad es más eficiente, los servicios que les prestamos son más eficientes. También hemos tenido que, que ser pioneros en muchas cosas, como por ejemplo, cómo evaluar en unos pliegos, en una licitación pública, la introducción de la tecnología. Pero desde luego que una vez salvados pues todas eh, esas dificultades que hemos tenido en estos años y que muchas ciudades que están aquí conocen perfectamente, pues hoy podemos decir que el beneficio para el ciudadano es importante. Y además revierte en un eh, ahorro también económico, porque la tecnología nos hace ahorrar. Y como muy bien has dicho en la presentación, llegaremos al punto en el que la ciudad de Santander también sea predictiva, también pueda adelantarse con todos los datos que tenemos y con esa plataforma en la que estamos trabajando ahora. Y desde luego que la ciudad pues no la hace un equipo de gobierno, no la hace una alcaldesa. Debemos de que los santanderinos eh, hagan también ciudad y la cocreación creo también que es otra herramienta que nos da la tecnología. Y con todo esto, pues la ciudad de Santander no tiene nada que ver en el año 2008 al año 2018. Santander to get us the possibility to be there from the early stage of this uh, passionate project. Uh, second thing I'd like to say is that we are not alone at the city of Santander. We are working together with very close partners, in this case with Telefonica, and we both are running uh, this tremendous uh, transformation, digital transformation of the city. Talking about our role, Our role is basically to be a technology provider uh, to enable the digital transformation in this case of a city. Which means a technology provider? Well, I would say NEC is own core technologies that uh, needs to be applied. You have mentioned in your uh, speech, uh, Charles, that uh, technologies like cloud, IoT, big data, Uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence, NEC is owned this kind of core technologies and on top of this our role is to provide to the city and to our partners an, a strategic vision about how to afford in this case a city a digital transformation project. And this strategic view that we have is based on an holistic approach Uh, to afford this digital transformation, which means that for us, the platform, the city platform, is the core, is the core and the enabler of all the transformation. And this is our view. This is respecting the role. And respecting uh, about the lessons learned, which is very, very important, I would like to mention three topics here. First topic is that one key thing is the politic leadership. In this case, the mayor, the political leadership of the mayor is key to enable this digital transformation. What does it mean? It means that the mayor needs to believe firmly that technology is adding value to the citizens and to the people. And secondly, the mayor needs to believe also, or the political leadership, that technology is adding value for a new management of the services of the city. At the end of the day, uh, there has to be a firm believer in the, that digital transformation and technology is getting a significant and tangible ROE for the entity, in this case of the city, and for all the people that is being part of the city. So this political leadership is key. The second point I'd like to mention is the public and private collaboration environment. So private companies needs, uh, private company needs public entities to collaborate with us and the vice versa. So I think that we have to develop 
and really push this environment of public and private collaboration. And last but not least, and the third point I'd like to mention is the ecosystem. It is very difficult to me to imagine that only one company or one entity can afford a digital transformation of a very complex environment like it's a city. So I would say Santander has been pioneer and, uh, in a very well strategy approach to create the right ecosystem to afford these complex projects. Which are the members of this ecosystem? Well, of course the city, of course the technology providers, but also university, also consultants, and maybe other partners. In my view, this is a matter of an ecosystem, not a matter of a single leadership. Thank you. I'm gonna take you, Mayor, on the memory lane a bit. Let's go back to Santander before becoming the story we're talking about today. Jaime talked about return on investment, ROI. How different is the city before and now for you as a mayor, for city officials, and for the people? Bueno, pues eh, la ciudad es totalmente diferente. Y es diferente también el concepto de qué esperan los ciudadanos o las empresas o el resto del mundo de la ciudad de Santander, porque yo diferenciaría en tres ámbitos. A nivel internacional, la ciudad, eh, vuelvo a decir, una ciudad pequeña, al norte del norte, 172.000 habitantes, pues no tenía un reclamo más que la belleza natural. Santander es una ciudad maravillosa que todos tienen que, que conocer, pero no tenía eh, ninguna referencia como para eh, poder exportar nuestro, nuestro producto. Y ahora sí lo tiene. Y ahora es la innovación. Y ahora pues muchas delegaciones eh, vienen a visitar la ciudad. En muchos medios de comunicación aparecemos por los avances en Smart City que estamos teniendo. Y esa internacionalización no teníamos un producto concreto o un ítem hasta este momento. También de cara a las empresas. Eh, los empresarios ven en la ciudad de Santander una oportunidad para desarrollar su negocio. También potenciamos con la innovación el emprendimiento, puesto que todos los datos que medimos en la ciudad son datos abiertos y en muchas ocasiones son materia prima para muchos emprendedores, para que inicien su, su desarrollo empresarial. Eh, también es oportunidad para eh, todas las empresas, la colaboración público-privada que también Jaime eh, hablaba, y, en un tercer lugar, el más importante para nosotros como Administración Pública es de cara al ciudadano. El ciudadano ha podido ver cómo se ha cambiado la forma de gestionar la ciudad de Santander, cómo tiene mejores servicios, más eficientes y más eh, baratos, porque realmente pues con lo que se ahorre en un servicio, con ese dinero, eh, se pueden hacer más cosas en beneficio de los ciudadanos. Con lo cual, diferenciaría perfectamente la internacionalización de cara al exterior, que ha sido una herramienta la tecnología para darnos a conocer. En el sector empresarial, que buscábamos justamente eso en la crisis, una oportunidad de futuro para Santander. Eh, en el sector de la innovación, pues eh, las empresas tienen que dar resultados en cuanto al servicio que dan. Nadie pregunta dónde está o cuánto, ubicada la empresa o cuántos empleados se tienen. Y Santander es una ciudad maravillosa para poder instalar una, una empresa tecnológica. Y el ciudadano, pues realmente los servicios que presta el ayuntamiento en el servicio de recogida de residuos, eh, en servicio de eficiencia energética, pues ha cambiado mucho la calidad de los servicios teniendo en cuenta la brecha eh, tecnológica de los ciudadanos y teniendo en cuenta también los tiempos y los ritmos de las administraciones, que no tienen nada que ver con los ritmos y los tiempos de implantación en las empresas públicas. Pero con todo esto, como dije al principio, es una ciudad totalmente diferente. Thank you. Now, Jaime, I'm going to go back to you and talk about the elephant in the room, as we add more yeah. the elephant in the room, security data privacy. As we add more and more devices and we do more and more transactions, we are opening up for exposure. How do you manage this in collaboration with the city to create the trust in the system with the user being the citizen or the actual city operators? Well, let me say that this is a difficult question, right? So I would say nothing is 100% secure today. It's, it's, it's a dream. To, to believe that uh, we have a 100% secure environment. Of course, in this case, uh, the, the HEMAS team or the, the, the team that is managing 
something very important, which is the data of all the citizens in a city, uh, they are making a very good job to protect this data, uh, to protect this data and also to guarantee that this data is being taken advantage only for the uh, management of the services of the citizen. So this is something that is key in this, in this case, their role managing this data. Of course, there are things that are happening and uh, we are all suffering right now as GDPR that are, are helping a lot uh, in the sense that our data has to be only managed for the reasons that we are providing the data. But having said that, I would say that there is another important point, if you allow me, which is the added value of the data that you are providing to a cloud, to a system, to a um, city. Uh, in the sense that if you perceive that the data that you are adding to the city cloud is coming back with a clear value to you, so then I would say that you are going to be much more comfortable or you are going to be much more confident in the data that you are delivering. So in this sense, again, again, if at the end of the day there is a clear return back in terms of the service that the CTC is receiving, is receiving, I would say that then they are going to be more confident to, to get data. But this is, is a key matter, is difficult, and again, the collaboration between technology that, uh, well, uh, Every day the technology is adding more value to the security, but the collaboration between the technology and the uh, team that is managing the data is key. Thank you. Mayor, we have 45 seconds. I'm going to give you those 43 seconds to give me a, a nugget of wisdom about your experience in driving this journey. Share with us an advice. Bueno, pues yo creo que, que hoy en día en un discurso político no puede faltar la, la innovación. Yo creo que las administraciones públicas, pero sobre todo los ayuntamientos, porque es quien gestionamos directamente o quien más expuestos estamos al ciudadano, más en primera fila y a las empresas que son el tejido, eh, el motor económico de las ciudades, pues debemos de potenciar. Como bien decía a Jaime, debemos de creernos que la tecnología es el medio para mejorar los servicios, para mejorar las empresas, para mejorar la calidad de vida en las ciudades y por eso debemos de apostar. Santander ya ha apostado porque ofrezco la ciudad de Santander como laboratorio urbano, ofrezco para que cualquier experiencia piloto se realice en nuestra ciudad y desde luego que como todos estamos de acuerdo de que la tecnología es el futuro, pues soy la primera que levanto la mano. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, stay with us. We have one more speaker and then we open it for question and answer. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Juanjo Hierno. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. The CTO of Fireware Foundation. He will talk about building a digital single market by implementation, a standardized building block. All this required standards. All right, so is the sound uh, well? Okay. So we were, this session was about taking the most out of data. And from my perspective, this has to do a lot about the uh, transformation journey of the cities uh, into uh, real smart cities. Uh, going through different stage where the cities are actually uh, taking more and more uh, value out of the data and how it could be exploited. If we uh, make an, a sort of analysis of where we are uh, regarding cities, we have to recognize we have been talking about smart cities for a long time, but actually there are not that many smart cities out there, I have to say. Yes, many cities have deployed uh, some vertical solutions to solve concrete challenges, maybe using the uh, um, most cutting edge technologies, IoT, AI, uh, big data, 
to solve uh, that particular problem. But the reality is that in many of these cities, these systems are information silos. There is a lack of uh, global picture the city needs to have to understand the proper way what's going on in the city, what are the insights behind what's happening. Cities also may have some open data initiatives, but in most cases they are feeling frustrated because these open data approaches in initiative has not delivered yet the promise. They are not willing that many innovative services, and in many cases, this has to do with the fact that the data is static, is historic, that's valuable data really, but is not the kind of data you need as a startup to create the kind of services that will change the life, the daily life of people. So we are facing a transformation journey where the cities have to evolve through different stages of maturity. And Fiverr is there to help them and bring support, positioning the right standards at each of these phases. So the first phase having to do with this breaking the silos of information to be able to understand what's going on in the city at overall city level, to be able to make those systems that otherwise are uh, information silos to really interoperate for the better uh, management of services to the citizens. To be able to construct on top of all the data coming from the different sources, um, all the uh, artificial intelligence, big data systems that may help to extract the necessary insight to uh, bring support to the smart decisions that the city has to put in place even automate certain processes. That is the first step. And some cities are already there. Santander actually was one of the pioneers in that space, but that is just the first step in the journey. The next step has to do with coming with a common language, a common model about what will be the description of the city. Standard data models are key and this is going to fuel a lot of innovation because the algorithms that at the end of the day have to work on data will benefit a lot for having data being uh, transferred, being captured, following same format, same semantics. The second step in this transformation journey has to do a lot with collaboration. Collaboration between sweet cities that wish to merge forces, join forces, towards definition of common information for solving, common information models for solving the same kind of challenges they are facing. This Monday, PM Forum and the Power Foundation made a big announcement, which will, uh, it's, it's actually going towards defining the right standards in this second stage, defining common information models. And we are going to do this not following a design by committee approach, but really working with the cities. Cities who are already pioneering by means of adopting the kind of reference architectures that needs to be uh, put in place, and which will work together to come up with a common set of information models they can use and they can share with cities that will come and want to follow this same path. This initiative, the Front Runner Cities, is an initiative that has already been joined by 11 cities all over the world. Cities like Vienna in Austria, like Utrecht in the Netherlands, Genoa in Italy, Santander and Valencia in Spain, um, cities like uh, Porto in Portugal, but also not just in Europe, also in Latin America, cities like La Plata, Montevideo, are these front runner cities that have decided to move into execution to create the kind of a standard that will allow to define 
a market, a digital single market for cities, which is the kind of thing we need for all this space about smart cities to be really sustainable over time. A city alone is not a market. Uh, cities have to join forces to create a market where solution providers, platform providers can invest, uh, seeking for maybe not sell your product to the first cities, but you know, taking into the perspective a real global market where they can port their applications and deploy them with little effort of adaptation. But that is not the end of the journey. The uh, Mayor of Santander already talked about triggering innovation. Cities have an opportunity, and I would say a responsibility, to become engines of growth, to become the kind of platform that will enable innovation. By means of making this data in the first place, and this has to do with the third stage of this process, to make this data available to developers. But has to be data in right time, not static data. Data about what's going on now, where, why. And this is the kind of data that um, will trigger true innovation. That would not be the last stage, because still what's happening in the city, the description of what's going on is not just about making the data that the city owns available. There is a lot of information about what's going on that is in the private sector. The uh, shops know what's going on in the shops, in the restaurants, uh, also the telecom providers. How we can make those actors also share their data to trigger innovation by means of combining the data by the city with the data coming from those providers. This has to do a lot with the transformation of uh, city into a platform and bringing support now with technology to data economy concepts. That is the last fourth of, uh, stage of the journey where Fiverr is delivering for each of these uh, phases the right standard. In the first phase, we are talking about bringing uh, standard APIs. Power and GSI is the sort of a standard that is gradually becoming the de facto standard in the smart city market, embraced by relevant organizations like GSMA or ETSI, the uh, European Standardization Body, but also with the European Commission this year taking the uh, major step of embracing fiber context broker technology and fiber NGSI as a building block that recommends public administrations to adopt when creating the infrastructures that will bring support to digital services that will work same way independently of the uh, country. Um, data models, again, are the standards we are putting in place, PM Forum, Fireware Foundation launched this initiative this Monday. 11 cities joined that, and all other cities are, of course, welcome to join this initiative uh, for the benefit of all. Two major results will come out of, uh, well, three major results will come out from this collaboration that we are setting up. First will be a reference architecture that cities may use as a guideline where implementing the policy of how I can deploy and put technologies and standard open technology in place, avoiding vendor locking in the city to support this transformation. The definition of data models that we will publish and they will be public and royalty free, so all the cities will be able to uh, benefit from this effort. And the cities that are joining the initiative will receive the credentials to uh, when, when they submit a given specification, because it's about also giving credit to those front runner cities like Santander, 
like Vienna, like Genoa, who are uh, taking the lead. And last but not least, the starting to pilot this very disruptive concept of supporting the data economy, enabling all the data that is there, not just in the city, but also in private companies to flourish and fuel the kind of innovation we are looking for. Um, I will finish just by announcing uh, uh, our event uh, next uh, uh, um, 27th and 28th of November in Malaga. It's the Power Summit, and we will run there, besides a full, I think, uh, fledged program of uh, speakers talking about the future of smart cities and projects they are running and executing in their cities two uh, major uh, meetings, which I think it uh, might be of, uh, for um, your interest. One is a kickoff meeting of this initiative we have launched together with CM Forum. Uh, the 11 cities I mentioned before will be there, but also other cities that are interested in joining uh, are happy to, to attend and also a workshop of the Connecting Europe Facility Program run by the Commission, uh, where they will uh, explain all the activities they will put in place for cities in Europe to uh, take the first steps into the transition of adopting this technology. So that is essentially the, the thing that I wanted to comment, and you are, of course, welcome to participate in this journey. Um, we hope to bring you all the support. Thank you. I have three questions. Uh, I'll combine a couple of them for you, Mayor, and possibly you, Jaime. You want to collaborate together on answering. Uh, can you give me some examples of the technological advances applied to the city of Santander today? and talk a little bit about what's next, the roadmap. Bueno, pues uno de los servicios que introduciendo la tecnología han cambiado, pues el último voy a contar, es la eficiencia energética. Acabamos de cambiar las 23.000 luminarias que hay en la ciudad. Ahora la telegestión es punto a punto. Antes, cuando necesitábamos por algún evento excepcional pues apagar dos farolas, no se podía, o no se apagaban o se dejaba toda la calle a oscuras y ahora con esa telegestión punto a punto lo podemos hacer. Hemos conseguido pues, reducir en 11.000 toneladas las emisiones de CO2, hemos eh, reducido la factura de la energía en un 80% y un 35% las labores de mantenimiento, puesto que las infraestructuras son nuevas. Eso es un ejemplo claro que se puede trasladar a los santanderinos y que además de tener una infraestructura pues, nueva, pues además es más eficiente. Eh, de cara al futuro tenemos dos eh, proyectos importantes y uno es esa plataforma. Somos una de esas ciudades, de esas 11 ciudades y, y junto con Valencia, las únicas de España, que estamos desarrollando con empresas con Telefónica y NEC esa plataforma, ese gran cerebro de la ciudad. Nosotros tenemos muchísimos sensores en la ciudad, hay 12.000 sensores que lo miden todo pero que al final son departamentos estancos, nos da el conocimiento de cómo está ese área, pero solo revierte en ese servicio. Ahora lo que queremos hacer es esas 65 verticales, unirlas en ese gran repositorio de datos, en la nube, en el cerebro, como lo queráis llamar, e interrelacionarlos para que cada vez podamos eh, tener mayor conocimiento de esos datos, interrelacionarlos y llegar a ser predictivos, que antes de que algo suceda, como la experiencia nos dice que cuando sucede hay otros, otras dos o tres cosas que pasan a continuación, pues eso ya lo sepamos y ya podamos ser eh, predictivos y gestionar la ciudad eh, desde, ese pulso, desde ese punto de vista. La información es muy buena, tener datos nos da el conocimiento, pero sa también saber cruzarlos es lo que debemos de, de hacer ahora. Y otro es eh, un proyecto de Smart City Zen con Red.es de 6,7 millones de euros en donde se concibe al ciudadano de manera integral. Llevamos muchos años dando pasos eh, en Smart Santander, pero debemos ya de dirigirnos al ciudadano de una manera única y de una manera integral. Habrá una tarjeta ciudadana que depende 
de la edad o del destinatario ha de ser una tarjeta física y si no ha de ser una tarjeta virtual, en donde tengas todos los servicios municipales, pueda hacer todas las gestiones, pueda reservar en el Instituto Municipal de Deportes, por ejemplo, una pista para hacer deporte, pueda pagar el, el autobús y pueda eh, acercarse al ayuntamiento sin tener que físicamente ir. También eh, hay un barrio tecnológico, una zona general de Ávila que vamos a hacer un barrio tecnológico para acercar cada vez más lo que es la tecnología al ciudadano y lo que debemos de hacer es que no conozca la tecnología técnicamente, pero sí que valore lo que eh, una ciudad eh, que tenga tecnología en la gestión puede pues, eh, mejorar la calidad de vida de los ciudadanos, que es lo que, lo que queremos. Thank you, Mayor. Juanjo, I, I have a very popular question for you. When Open API will be publicly available, and I will ask you another one myself, and please keep your questions coming. Well, I think uh, in this standardization process, In this standardization process we mentioned, uh, there are two aspects. One is the APIs, application programming interfaces. That is, has been there from FIWA quite uh, since a long time, and now it's becoming an Etsy standard, so the specifications are already there. Uh, when talking about data models is what is coming to next steps. There are work already uh, there that uh, has been adopted already by some of these front-runner cities that joined the program together with TM Forum. Um, and we are donating those uh, data, initial data models to the effort, but new models will come. So first publication of uh, specifications endorsed by both Fiverr and TM Forum will be coming next, uh, next year. I wanted to take advantage to mention some of the cities that I forgot to mention. So, very briefly, uh, as part of these 11 cities, we have also cities in France, uh, the cities of Nice and Saint Quentin, and also the uh, Gothenburg in the in the country of Sweden. So, you, you quite a variety of. You countries. saved yourself, <laughs> <laughs> Mayor. I have a question for you from the audience. Uh, How do you plan to engage the citizen to collaborate with the city? Bueno, pues ha sido difícil porque es cierto que pues la brecha tecnológica existe, es cierto que todos en nuestras ciudades pues la calidad de vida cada vez es mejor y la esperanza de vida también, con lo cual más gente mayor hay, pero también es eh, cierto que como he dicho antes no pretendemos que entiendan de tecnología, porque es muy difícil. Lo que pretendemos es que valoren que la tecnología eh, va a hacer que vivan en una ciudad mejor y va a hacer que su calidad de vida aumente. Pero también siendo didácticos, un edificio que tenemos, el edificio del Palacio de Pronillo, el edificio, el edificio civil más antiguo que tenemos en la ciudad de Santander, se ha rehabilitado y ahí tenemos un centro de demostraciones de Smart City donde van los ciudadanos y también hacemos visitas didácticas con colegios y donde les explicamos en un lenguaje coloquial y cada uno eh, pues teniendo en cuenta quién tenemos eh, enfrente, pues donde les explicamos a los niños o a los adultos qué es ser una ciudad inteligente. Recuerdo todavía cuando estaba el anterior alcalde, cuando estaba Íñigo de la Serna, pues que pusimos sensores a los taxistas, a los taxis, les pusimos sensores móviles y nos decían, bueno, si a mí no me controla ni mi mujer, ¿por qué me quiere controlar el alcalde? Bueno, pues también quitando eh, pues ese miedo que se tiene a, a, a los datos, a la intimidad de los datos, bueno, pues explicando también que son patrones de comportamiento. Yo creo que hay mucho de ser didáctico y mucho de resultados, de que entiendan que la tecnología es el medio para mejorarles la calidad de vida. All right, I have a question for both of you, Juanjo and Jaime. Uh, if you don't have standards, it's a problem. If you have heavy standards, it's a problem. How do you strike a balance? When you, what's the minimum set of things you want to do not to overkill innovation? And a follow-up on that, Jaime, is as a corporate, how do you use the standards and what value it creates for you? Well, um, okay. uh, you made a very interesting question because actually too much standardization may kill innovation. So we have to find the right balance of 
what are the minimum set of standards. And I think the essential aspect when we talk about smart cities is what are standards I need to capture the information of what's going on. Because that is the basis. And then on top of that is where you can create algorithms and everything to exploit that data. And that is where you have to leave some space for innovation. You cannot standardize the algorithms necessary. You have to bring their space for uh, companies to innovate and bring different value. But the capture of the essential data that uh, will be the basis for all that is where we need to put emphasis on standardization. Well, I <coughs> am sharing the, the point of view of Juanjo. Uh, of course, standardization is very important in order to be able to replicate solutions, right? So, which is no meaning for us is to create like a kind of a, a close environment for a city. Uh, we really would like to be able to replicate uh, this model. So in this sense, standards like fireware or other kind of standards in communications and so on are really key things in order to uh, be able to, to lead this kind of systems that are, are, are really important. At, at the same time, uh, as one commission, I think this is not closing doors to innovation because you can create a lot of innovation around these basic standards. Right? All right, I do have a question for all of you. We start with you, Mayor. We talked about the notion of data economy. We talked about transforming cities into a platform. What's the role of city in that? In, in enabling uh, the data economy and the city as a platform. If you want, we can start with Juanjo. Okay, yes. Um, actually, uh, one important thing is, is has to do with trust. Uh, the citizens, the uh, businesses uh, wish to see a neutral space where they know that the data will be managed uh, the right way, uh, only used for what they want uh, to allow it is used. And in that sense, uh, cities can become this sort of neutral space, uh, this neutral platform where data, not only from cities, but also third parties can be exposed and, and somehow not be only at the hands uh, or you know hosted by a particular player. So in that sense, I think uh, we are talking about creating public infrastructures in a way and uh, public administrations can uh, be the trustable parties for, for the citizens to play. Bueno, pues nosotros no concebimos no ir de la mano de empresas públicas porque lo venimos haciendo de esa manera. Yo creo que el prestar la ciudad como laboratorio urbano pues es eh, el mayor apoyo a esas empresas que después van a, a desarrollar la tecnología porque, por un lado, es la apuesta más firme que se puede hacer y por otro lado también eh, pues a la hora de, de hacer las open calls las empresas y de hecho en la que me he referido antes de esos tres millones de euros de Organicity las eh, empresas se han interesado en primer lugar por la ciudad de Santander tenemos 113 iniciativas que quieren desarrollar su, su, su trabajo en la ciudad de Santander y es porque no hay una empresa que les llama si no es la propia ciudad la que dice aquí está la ciudad, aquí están los sensores y aquí podemos hacer eh, de laboratorio urbano. Creo que esa es la mayor apuesta y además eh, la prueba la traemos porque venimos trabajando así. Es más, Santander nació de la Universidad de Cantabria y del Ayuntamiento de Santander. Las administraciones en la universidad fueron unidas, pero siempre en todo el camino han estado empresas privadas que incluso se han querido aliar con la ciudad con Ferroser Servicios, con Telefónica, con NEC. Tenemos eh, centros de demostraciones en la ciudad. Se han interesado eh, para eh, hacer sus demos en nuestra ciudad porque, porque creemos en ello lo primero, lo primero nosotros y somos nosotros quienes ofrecemos el, el territorio. Y por eso creo que, que es importante, porque si no, el hacer cualquier otro despliegue en una ciudad sin el apoyo institucional pues en permisos burocráticos y en tiempos de espera creo que se iría el interés de las empresas privadas y por eso debemos de ir de la mano, pero digo, no porque sea lo correcto, sino porque lo venimos haciendo. Yes, uh, in our view, as I mentioned in my previous uh, speech, uh, 
in our strategy, cities are becoming a key thing. Why? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, one reason is that cities are becoming bigger and bigger. And uh, cities are the place where human being is interacting with everything. I mean, it's interacting with your job, your private life, your, uh, well, free time, etc. So the concept to transform the city in a platform is very important for our strategy. And uh, I'm very happy that um, a city like Santander has been pioneer, as Gemma has been saying, to offer this city as a lab for companies like us uh, that can apply the core technologies to the cities. In this sense, I think this platform has to lead the data economy because uh, data is, is key today. And in this sense, I would like to add another point that in my mind, there is another driver uh, of this evolution that um, is getting to me the idea that this cannot be stopped, which is new generations. I mean, the new generations of people cannot believe in a city without a technology that able them to manage all the services all their life. Uh, the new generation are online, always connected. There has to be a device. There has to be an app. And uh, all the life is connected on this. So this is very important to provide this kind of environment to our new generations in the city. Thank you. I couldn't uh, ask all your questions. I know you had specific question to Fireware. The panel will be around for the next 15 minutes enjoying the coffee and answering your questions. Please join me in thanking them and we will meet again here at 12.50. Thank you. Okay, uh, buenos dias, good morning, and welcome everybody to this panel session about data-driven cities. It, I'm Rosa Martin from the Technical University of Catalonia, and it's an honor to chair this uh, great uh, panel of experts that will share with us their perspective on how data can be used to better understand people and cities, and in consequence, to transform our cities. Uh, this session, as, as you know, is part of an overall thematic program, and we are in the second part. And it is itself divided in two parts. The first one uh, consists in uh, the four presentations from our experts that come from different, uh, they have different points of view. Uh, Klaus Hoffman, that will be the first one, he is a city leader and he's in responsible of uh, uh, research and innovation in the city of Grenoble. We have also two data platform providers that will share with us their experiences and lessons learned in different cities around the world. And finally, we will have, uh, the, uh, we will have the point of view of uh, uh, Innovation Center with Esteban Mirai, that is also the director of the Innovation City from ESADE. So um, I will ask also you to submit your questions using the Smart City apps. As you know, uh, we will use this for the debate, and this is very important in this panel session because we will have 15 minutes debate, and we will welcome your, all your uh, questions and anything you want to propose for the debate using the microphone or the Smart City apps. So thank you very much, and please uh, welcome to the stage uh, to Klaus Hoffman. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure as a city leader to share a vision with you from Grenoble, France, a city, half a million inhabitants, which is best known for the Olympic Winter Games and also for its research centers. And in the world of cloud-based solutions, I would like to talk about the edge. 
because computing in the edge, we believe, must play a more prominent role, like on this photo of Grenoble with a guy on the edge and not a single cloud. Of course, we need clouds for the weather and also for the computing. But cloud or edge can make a big difference. Just imagine Amazon's Echo not needing the cloud, but just working offline. Or just imagine the iPhone 10 needing access to iCloud in order to unlock the phone. So for the engineer, edge or cloud is about speed, latency, and cost. But for the cities and for citizens, it's also about data ownership and privacy and management of data. So edge computing is fully compatible with open data. That's not the key question. The key question is the value proposal for cities. And today, as we heard already by Fireware, of course, every vendor of city solutions tries to lure the customers into a vertical system where you have a cloud on the top and you have actuators and sensors at the bottom. And then you have uh, application interfaces and middleware that might be open source, but the system itself is vertical. And then you have one for smart street lights, one for smart traffic lights, one for building management, and then one, one for waste bin collection and so forth. And of course, this reflects the city's internal structure. So for cities, it's easy to set up. But it's merely using IT to make bigger productivity to deliver public services cheaper. That's not yet the smart city. So what's in for the citizens? We have never seen, of course, if you have more productivity, that the price of a public service will go down. So the smart city will give citizens insight and it will give them the possibility to change, to change towards the smart city. And in order to create this value, you need the personal data. Open data on its own and city anonymous data will not make citizens change. But you have to merge personal data into the open data. And for example, smart meters. Most citizens don't understand what kilowatt hours are. You have to use an app and the personal data from your smart meter together with the open data about what your neighbors are consuming in order to change your electricity consumption. This personal data is stored, of course, well locked away in Grenoble, like in most other cities, in silos. And we, may, we believe that these silos must be opened. And that the citizen, on the other hand, has to retain the right to keep the mastership of his data. This is called self-data. And our our implementation in Grenoble of self-data will include a local universal data repository which is managed by the city, overseen by us and our, by our chief digital officer and the ethics committee, but the citizens retain the ownership to release data for somebody or for a business or for a service or to retain it. And uh, of course, this should be easily up-based, uh, like uh, you see it here on a smartphone, like people pay on the app. They can then, for example, um, release also data from crowd sensing into open data. Here you have a small sensor made in Grenoble that measures air pollution. Crowd sourcing of data is very important to complement the da sourcing of open data by the cities themselves. And if you have this approach, you can actually use both crowd sourcing and sourcing by open data from the cities in order to create databases where citizens retain the mastery of what they feed into the system. Of course, for this, you need trusted devices. You need a trusted uh, app or API, and you need trusted sensors. And this brings me to a subject that was already talked about by Fiverr again. We need standardization. We need standards so that the data that is produced can be interchanged also between systems among cities. And the big push for standardization will come from the, from the self-driving car, which, of course, is not self-driving. It's called connected autonomous vehicle because uh, it needs also a connection to other cars and to a city infrastructure in order to be self-driving. But this will be a game changer in terms of city IoT infrastructure. It's not for tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, but we have to anticipate it. The important thing is also that, this infra that the self-driving car will not be run by the cloud. It will take its decision itself. So edge processing and edge computing is built into the self-driving car. Nobody knows today who will manage the in IoT infrastructure. There are big companies who would like to provide it all. We believe cities must be in the infrastructure. Ideally, they must provide it, or they must at least be on the co-pilot seat. 
This is a fight we are currently regulating the CAV, a fight we are currently fighting with the uh, regulator in order to be able to be a player in the CAV, we and other big French cities. A big city also has to provide uh, the platform uh, for mobility as a service. For this reason, we will be taking back, for example, in Grenoble, all public car parks into city administration to integrate it into an overall mobility as a service offer as of 2019-2020, in which when private operators like bike sharing and car sharing can move in and we require them to use the same platform uh, in order to get the financial flows through that platform into an overall global service. So a recent study by Siemens coined the term strong city for a city where the authorities take a proactive and holistic approach and not just let things happen. And the private sector has an important role, but the city is the leader. And the city leaders are leading the city. The private sector will provide technology, he will provide expertise, and he will provide solutions that can be transported from city and deployed elsewhere. But we don't want players global players that cut out the local value creation chain and that siphon all the data away in order to resell it then uh, and get all the benefits out of the city onto their bank accounts. Let's come back to the citizens. Uh, here's again a slide on, on, on what we believe what the strong city should be about. Let's come back to the citizens, of course, whose smartphones are very well suited um, to be the platform for them interacting with the smart city. And that means that we have to have apps, and that means that we have to be, have, to have APIs uh, that are running on these sm smartphones. But we believe that also computing has to be more and more in these devices, and not only in the cloud. The Orange Labs in Grenoble, uh, we are currently working on a solution using 5G networks, uh, which we will deploy shortly. Uh, which will also give greater connectivity to the IoT cloud, the personal IoT cloud of citizens, and it will provide interconnectivity between personal IoT cloud and the public cloud of IoT devices. You have been listening to a very short vision of a city leader, and I have to admit that this is to a large extent also shaped by ST Microelectronics and by Schneider Electric or by Orange Lab, our industry key players in Grenoble. And Jean-Marc Chéry, the CEO of ST, recently told a conference I spoke as well. He said, it is clear that Europe has totally failed to be a leader in contacting 5 to 10 billion people. Europe is today out of the PC, out of the phone, out of personal electronics. It's out of the smartphone. And then he added, but we can do better. We can win the battle to connect 50 billion devices, to connect automobiles, trucks, scooters, to make smart factories, infrastructure, healthcare, and planes. We can win the battle to make them more natural and neutral to the climate. And I would like to add to conclude, we can win this battle if we leverage on Europe's industrial base in sensors and in embedded processing and in AI, where we control 50% of the world market. And we can win this battle if we leverage on the power of Europe's cities, which are world leaders in good governance, in public investment, and in citizen empowerment. So let's transform our cities down on earth and not only in the cloud. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claude. Our next speaker is Carmen Muñoz, the CEO of Sibelum Group. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here today. And thank you uh, for uh, listening to this uh, roundtable. I am uh, Carmen Muñoz, the CEO of Sibelum Group. Huh? So we are a service provider for the cities. And uh, we work in three fields uh, about attractiveness in the city, uh, more uh, about uh, street lighting, uh, smart lighting, uh, security, per safe security with CCTV, but also with other solutions, and also everything about urban mobility, traffic lights, uh, information uh, sensors, pollution sensors, and so on. <coughs> and we, uh, uh, what we do is we design, we build, we operate, and we can even finance large-scale pro projects. Um, we have an, a, a smart city platform that is called Muse, where we have IoT analytics, uh, uh, CMS uh, and uh, also uh, uh, connectivity with all the people working on the field. And this platform is not just one idea. We have 
150 cities that are using this uh, around the world. So we have some experience now uh, since uh, 15 years on uh, data. And um, I would like to share with you some key ideas on what we are seeing around the world in the US, uh, in South America, uh, India, China, Europe, and North Africa, is that uh, we need to uh, deal with some key topics about data, that it's something very important for the smart city. The first one is openness. Uh, it was a time when a lot of providers wanted to have their own platform very close so that they keep the client forever is no m useful anymore. The clients want to be free and to have open platform and to be able to change of provider if they wish. So uh, uh, now openness is something that is key to have uh, a platform that can be connected uh, and uh, also to be able uh, to share the data. Uh, the second one is data standardization. Uh, Juan Joyerro from Fewer talked previously of this need uh, to have the same referential for data, to be able to keep this data and to share it on open data uh, with other actors. Another key issue is ownership. Um, it's uh, very important that the city is sure to be the proprietary of the data. The citizens are key. The citizens elect majors. The majors implement projects, and they don't want to be product. And uh, in a project about data, when uh, uh, everything is free, the product is the citizen. So uh, this is key, and the cities need to be uh, very careful on being sure of be, uh, being the owner of the data. Privacy and individual protection is key also. And this is very different for, from one part or another around the world. Uh, we are mainly in, Euri in Europe. I think that many of you come from uh, European countries. Uh, and in Europe, privacy is very important. But for example, uh, when you go to the US or when you go to Asian countries, you don't have the same kind of issues. So it's something that the uh, city uh, the city governors need to deal with and to be sure what kind of privacy they want to provide to the, the, the citizen and regarding also to regulation that are quite different regarding to one country or another. Something that is key is the business model, the use of data. And this use of, of data is very important. Uh, some years ago, some providers proposed to have a lot of sensors, a, a big cloud, and said, OK, we are going to put uh, artificial intelligence, and this is going to provide value. And it doesn't work like that. So to be sure that uh, uh, the city have a sustainable model, how uh, you have new incomes, or how you are going to have savings in order to pay uh, for the infrastructure and the platform is something that is key to take into account the business model of the project. And the last but not least, uh, we have also sustainability issues uh, on data. Uh, you can have a huge project with SCADA taking a lot of uh, broadband information and lots of energy, and so there is something that is key about sustainability. And so for, for, for this, um, working with um, edge computing solution is something that is very interesting, putting the intelligence of the system in the edge uh, to avoid taking all the data to a central system with uh, a lot of energy consumption. You, you have also uh, issues on resilience. For example, if you have a problem with uh, the platform, uh, the city will stay working. So those are key things uh, uh, that we have seen uh, all around the world. And I would like to finish with three projects. I could uh, talk about 150 projects, uh, but Copenhagen. Copenhagen, the city, wants to be carbon uh, neutral in 2025. And it was key for them to be sure 
that everything about energy was tra transparent and with KPIs that were respected. So uh, they use uh, the data to control the energy use. Uh, and uh, something that we have pr provided for them is about the street lighting system with almost 70% energy savings. And they are checking all the KPIs of the project with the platform and they have real time information on what's happening on the field. So they use this to control that and these energy savings are key to finance the project. <coughs> Other one that is very interesting and this is presented here in a Smart City uh, uh, World Congress is Dijon. In this case, they have energy savings to finance the project, but also uh, the way the city operates uh, the uh, urban space is key, interacting with all the actors, uh, public and private, and so they use the platform to communicate with each other and to deliver efficiency. And they have also the vision of city as a platform with an uh, open data part, but governed by the city, and also when with new uh, apps developed by a startup and uh, solution providers, uh, and everything is governed uh, by the city because they want to be sure that they create value for the citizen. Very interesting project that you can see here, even in our stand this afternoon. And uh, the last one is Albuquerque project in the US. In this case, privacy issues are not the same than in Europe. And they have safety issues with a lot of problems with car steals. So uh, uh, we have uh, done uh, a, smart, a street light, uh, a smart lighting project, but we are also working with CCTV and plate control system, and uh, everything is controlled by the police because their key issue is to improve the safety in the city, the security, and uh, in this case, they want very strong KPIs on that. So, what I wanted to share is some key issues uh, learned by uh, our experience with the city, and that every one of these projects has specific KPIs, a specific goals, uh, and the data are key for them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carmen. So our next speaker is Mr. Rui Costa from uh, UbiWare. May I start? Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm, I'm Rui Costa. I'm co-founder of UbiWare. UbiWare is a Portuguese group of ventures providing interoperable data-driven solutions suiting the future of cities. Um, we are based in, in, in Portugal, as I said, with offices in Porto, Lisbon, Aveiro, and Coimbra, but with an international, international presence. This is our footprint, worldwide footprint, of smart city solutions using uh, UbiWare technology. How can we do it uh, internationally being a mid-sized company? We have uh, done strategic uh, cooperation with international uh, alliances mostly and with huge efforts on harmonization of data and standardization with uh, governmental and standardization uh, bodies. Let me show you some examples and use cases of our last deployment, starting with mobility and specifically with our bike sharing spin-off. 20 cities around the world, mostly in the US, uh, 4,000 electric bikes, uh, but also uh, in, uh, interactive kiosks, uh, solar panels in the canopies, uh, electrical dock docking uh, stations, in the most severe conditions, from 30 negative degrees to more than 40 degrees in the Middle East. Also in the mobility uh, sector, smart parking in Portugal, South Africa, and uh, Mexico. Also in the mobility uh, um, sector, we have enabled cities, but also transportation service providers with insights and on how they should plan their uh, strategy for traffic, but also logistics. I'm talking about uh, cities in Germany, Porto, Greece, 
but also big service providers like Deutsche Bank. From mobility to environment, waste. So we have a pay as you throw solution uh, we are with access control to the containers, optimizing routes of collection of each uh, container or bin, uh, but also uh, measuring the fill level of each container, mostly in Portugal, this one. Um, also on the environmental sector, uh, water meter uh, measurements. So here, not on the sensor part, but on the insights that we give to cities, but also to uh, city service providers like water co uh, distribution companies on how they should uh, plan their network of distribution, but also to detect leak, uh, uh, leaks in, in, in their networks. Third uh, sub, sub um, vertical on air quality. We have a, a network of more than 100 uh, air quality monitoring stations in Porto. Uh, we are providing this as a service. We don't want to, to sell the, the, the product, the hardware itself. We, we provide maintenance, all the support, changing the filters, and we give data and insights on top of that data for the city and the city service provider to measure and to plan their network. Second level, crossing two verticals, uh, environment and uh, mobility. For example, calculating what is called green, green routes. So considering the, uh, the air conditions, their pollution, for example, we optimize the routes for bikes, for pedestrians, um, you name it. The, the third vertical, big vertical, telecom. So we help telecom operators, but also utilities, uh, energy uh, providers, and smart lighting providers to integrate, for example, small, cel small cells from 5G in their network with our knowledge on telecom, on the telecom sector, and again, data-driven solutions. And our most recent uh, product, our urban platform that integrates all these verticals from ourselves, but also from third parties, uh, in order to have an holistic view of a city, and again, insights, and helping decision makers to make their decisions based on data on, and on information. Let me give you a glimpse of our most recent product with a video. If you want to know more, I'm more than happy to guide you through our booth, D409, main corridor on the right if you go to the, to the main door. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Esteban Mirai from uh, the uh, Center for City Innovation. <laughs> 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 Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to talk about uh, about data-driven cities. Uh, all cities in general, all organizations want to be data-driven, data-driven. And this seems to be quite elusive. And I'm only talking about three things. There's three things of how, what can we do in order to be more data-driven, in order to be less elusive, be challenged. I mean, th the first thing is data granularity. And let's, this is a paper from some of our colleagues in UPF, and this is a paper about 
uh, student. A uh, student entered, entered the school when, at the age that they are six. That means that for some of them, uh, they are one year old, and some of them, they are not even six. So there is a big gap. Uh, one question is, what is the impact of this gap in the performance of children? Well, this is the impact. It's quite important. It's not a small thing. Well, you can only have this data, you can only have this graphic if you have data granularity. You can only talk about the different impact in the different schools if you have data from each school. You can only talk about the impact in, in hospitals if you have data from each hospital and each center of the hospital. So granularity makes a big difference. The second thing that is interesting is about challenges. What type of challenges do we put in our data? Do we put on front of us? And I, I brought you three examples. I mean, the first example is a study uh, from uh, New York. And the question was very simple. In New York, you have around 12,000 taxis, more or less the same that, that in Barcelona, and 120,000 Uber cars and so on that is going around, M many more than Barcelona. <laughs> so the question was, uh, how many taxis do we need in order to provide the same service if they were shared? So it happens that with only 2,000, of these taxis, if we had vehicles with 10 people, or 3,000, if we have normal taxis with four people, we can have the same service that we have with four times that number, 12,000. So this is an interesting challenge. Uh, let me show you a second example, and this comes from UK. Uh, and this is an example of what would happen if we could, if all the doctors uh, use generics instead of using brand medicine and so on. This is only one compound, statins. Statins is for uh, reducing blood pressure. Only in UK, only one compound, uh, 27 million pounds per month if we use generics. Statins are the same if it's branded or it's generic. It's the same compound, the same. Uh, let me show you one, one third example. And this is in San Francisco, and this is one of my favorite examples. Many people die in our streets, and many people die in our high roads. Why should people die in a city street? Why should this happen? We are in the 21st century. So this was the question that Major Lee, that uh, died uh, one year ago, put himself in San Francisco, and these were the deaths. Well, they, they use machine learning, and well, the, the the data was clear, and it's also that happens in many other places. 70% of the injuries are in 12% of the intersections. It's 80-20 rule that we all know. Well, what are they doing? Well, repair or change the 12% of the intersections. Come on. It's as simple as that. Maybe we have some people still dying, but we will reduce it by 70%, which is a lot. And in San Francisco, it's not that big. It's a little bit bigger than Bangalore, but not that much. So 12% of the intersections are not so many intersections. And this is what they are doing with the intersections. There's more or less a copy of uh, what has happened, what the type of intersections that you have in Amsterdam or in Copenhagen, all these uh, sit bike cities that we have in Europe. The first thing that I would like to talk is, well, this data needs to be analyzed. This data, we need consequences. We need to find whys in this data. And for that, uh, we need mm, data labs. But these data labs, it's important that they are independent. And it's important that they are diverse. And independent and diverse is more important here than in any other field. Because it's impossible to know who is going to find the right answer with the data. And if you have only one data lab that processes all the answers, well, it's <coughs> a recipe for failure because it's very unlikely that these people are going to find always the right approach and the right data. That's why independent and diverse is so, so, so important. And uh, data labs are appearing normally as an spin-off of the universities, a joint venture with the universities, um, many of these kind of things. This is the one from California, that is uh, University of California. It's a partnership between Berkeley and LA. Uh, the two different departments, and here we have 
and all the ones from the ones from Chicago and the ones from Washington State, and also in in Europe, we they are appearing in London, they are appearing in Amsterdam, and so on. But independent and diverse, it's very important. Well, this was the my free my free insights here. There is one more and one last. Uh, we need leadership, and this is the office of the mayor of Boston. And the office of mayor of Boston has a dashboard. And leadership is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. So thank you. It's been very easy to moderate you because we've been very strict with the time. So now it's time for the debate. And I would like you to submit your questions. Uh, but uh, I have a, a first one, and I would like you to say something about how do you think smart cities should deal with uh, personal data? So maybe you can start. Uh, personal data, of course, it could be personal data which is in the city domain. It could also be personal data that is personal data collected elsewhere in, by private business or by, by other players. We believe it's important to have a local alliance of people who manage private data. And because I told that we should, we would like to have a concept of self-data where the citizen retains the ownership. But of course, it's important that all this data is aggregated in a depository so that it can be used for good use. But it's the citizen who decides. OK, you want to add something? Yes, I think that um, there are two use issues. The first one is a regulatory one. You need to respect law. Uh, for the cities and also for the private companies. And, and in Europe, we have a very protective law on uh, personal data. So you cannot collect uh, facial recognition on the street, for example. You can do it in China, but not in Europe. So the law and the regulation. And the second one is that the technology allow today to get uh, data and to work on that uh, to protect the individual data. For example, if you want uh, to deal with safety, uh, you can have uh, with edge computing and artificial intelligence the images that are taken from the CCTV, analyze and just send alert protecting the individual data. So you have also te the technologies to deal with that. So those issues, regulation and solution to keep personal data on the edge. Do you think that uh, data labs could be used to, to build some trust uh, for the citizens and, and also? Yeah, the, well, personal data is <coughs> a very important thing in Barcelona. We have, in the agenda of the city, we have data sovereignty, and this is one of the leading cities here uh, in, in regarding personal data. They also, here they are developing plans on around uh, my data that is from Finland, but also around uh, an application for my data to control personal data. Uh, data labs uh, have a big challenge on that because you need granularity, but you need privacy. Mm -hmm. And now with, uh, with AI, we are able to tap into the, into the bias of the people and in that way uh, manage people much more than we ever thought that would be possible. Uh, take people in the moment that they are more weak and so on. So probably we can guess that the people who have has this data, they will do it sooner or later they will do it. That's a big problem. Okay, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, the first, uh, the most popular is, have you considered to provide to the citizens a way to monetize their private data and engage them to collaborate with the city? Do you want Rui to start? <laughs> um, I, I should be honest. I, I don't have a clear vision on how smart cities relate to personal data. Um, so cities basically uh, manage public space, right? If cities manage public space, and if we are uh, aware that we are using public space, how can we deal with it? So will some uh, regulation prohibit cities of having video cameras, of um, monitoring, um, whatever uh, we are talking, so goods, services, uh, vehicles, faces. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 don't, I don't have a clear vision on that. And monetizing uh, the data that you, you storage, 
that you store uh, is even more difficult for me. If you are talking about the private sector mm -hmm. and if you consent to, to give uh, access to, the, to your data and for the company or whatever institution, private one, to explore uh, analytics on top of the data, the raw data, it's one thing. But municipalities or even uh, public national administrations, mm -hmm. uh, I have doubts. They want to add something. My answer is no. <laughs> we are not Google. Google is doing that uh, very well, much better than we could do it. And so, uh, no. What we do is to encourage the citizens to give data, not personal data, but to help the city to improve uh, uh, the way it works and everybody lives together. For example, to send information on the field when they see uh, that something is not working well, a luminary, or they see waste on the street, and so on, to share this information or an accident. And so they say, okay, I am uh, Mr. Dupont, uh, and I have seen something there. We keep the information just to deal uh, with uh, this event and to give a feedback, and after we arrest the information and we respect the rules. But uh, I think that uh, in the future we will have different business models that I explain. Uh, and uh, some uh, actors like Google are going to say, okay, we put all the infrastructure, we, uh, uh, we, we put everything, and we get all the data. And we are going uh, to make a product from the citizen. It's what they are doing in Toronto. But this is not our business model. So the answer is no. Just, okay, one minute. Yes, we want to add something. <laughs> Sorry. Now I have to, <laughs> to answer. Okay, the easy answer is no. <laughs> but how can we stop it? Can, uh, how, how can ourselves or even our public administration stop uh, uh, Asian initiatives or American companies from doing it? May maybe we could uh, hear the city perspective okay. closely. Uh, <laughs> the word monetize is not the good one. It's, I would say, create value. Mm -hmm. And this is yeah, what I try to outline with yeah. the example of uh, using smart meter data in mm -hmm. order to uh, mm -hmm. educate people to use less energy. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to create value for the mm -hmm. citizens, we will also be able to educate them not to give their data away freely to, to Google, but rather to keep it in order to reserve it for people who create value with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I mostly agree with that. I mean, uh, we have a good example in Barcelona, this tourism, and there is a lot of discussion. And one of the insights is that, well, the tourist tax should create value for the one who suffer the tourist. And, and this could be a nice reward. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens with data. The problem that we have is that uh, we know that we need a new regulation to prevent or to do, th to stop or, or to limit the power of the Googles of today and the Googles of tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow will be a different Google, but it will be somebody because of the enormous possibilities that, that exist. But how this uh, new regulation has to be is not clear. And this is our fault. Uh, we have to think about in clever ways to structure this new regulation that can align the interest of everybody. Uh, complaining about the, the enormous bad possibilities and bad things that can happen with technology is not enough. We have to find ways uh, to limit these effects and align. Uh, and this is uh, our job and this is our challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes, can I think that something that is key is the value. Why one citizen give uh, the data, for example, uh, maybe I would be interested in giving all my personal data about my health beca because it will be useful to me to have uh, health services uh, and even be in help if I have an accident. So citizens give data because of value, not just, value is not just money. So I think that um, uh, uh, cities and uh, city providers like, like us have a big responsibility to provide value to the citizens. Mm -hmm. if, if the smart city project is just a lot of sensors with no value and the citizens sees, see nothing after that, uh, maybe they are going to go to Google because Google offers services. Mm -hmm. So it's key that the uh, political project of the city is a strong one uh, and the way the data is, use, is protective for the citizens and the value that is created is might much important, much sugar than uh, with uh, this kind of companies. And 
In that, really, I encourage you to, to look at Dijon project, because it's a very interesting project by the city, a very important political project in which they put the data, the health of the issue, and is the city who is going to provide a lot of services to the citizen mm -hmm. so that they think that collaborate with the city would be much more useful than give everything to uh, Google, Amazon, or other actors. Okay, we have time for a very short answer and for a second question that is, what is the responsibility of municipalities if its citizens' data are stolen and misused? Uh, of course, if we have, if we own data, which are in particular personal data, we have to protect it even better than private companies because they are very often, I think, of health data, mm -hmm. of data about the social situation of people. They are even more sensitive. So we have to be very, very careful in protecting the data and we take this responsibility. I be, I, this is independent of my political sensibility. All politicians, all city leaders take this responsibility very serious. And this is why sometimes actually we seem to move slower. It's because we have this responsibility. We cannot go bankrupt. Uh, we are res hold, held responsible forever for any misconduct or any theft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. Uh, I will add that uh, we need an European action on that. We, we see data breaches everywhere in uh, huge uh, in technological companies that have huge resources like Facebook and so on. It's impossible that a small village or a small city has all this level of security. In the US, uh, the, the American government has a separate Amazon part that is Amazon.gov that is not connected. Uh, well, uh, Europe has to do something and take this matter seriously and, and provide a, a way for European municipalities and in general European governments to protect data in a more accurate way. Do you want to add something? Have 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that it's very important that the city put that uh, on their tenders. When they uh, launch a tender, they need to put uh, the data and the data protection and the data security at the heart of the system. And uh, the private providers can provide so a solution and explain why they are secure. And this is very important. So thank you very much. I hope you have all learned a lot from these uh, panelists. And I would like you to give a big hand to all of them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we, you're, you're free to stay for the next three minutes because I'm going to just wrap up the whole two hours. And your, imp your input is very welcome. I promise you it's not going to take more than three minutes because everybody want to go to lunch. Anyway, we started the discussion about everything is about creating a better relation with citizen. Everything we do about smart is about servicing the people of the city. We agreed that connectivity is the foundation. You cannot do anything without it. But also we talked about three accelerating trends that are transforming cities. One is the IoT, and within we looked at the sensing advancement, we looked at the cloud, AI, etc. We looked at the big data, and you talked a lot about it, we'll come to that. And we concluded that the new era is about AI and how it's gonna help us unravel insight that we've never been able to do before for many reasons, being cost, time, etc. Now, we talked about the data economy, and what's interesting is the role of data in transforming cities, and we talked with the mayor and NEC about a case study about it, but what's interesting in this panel is how the journey goes on from, we're at early stage, we're not ready for scale because we don't have enough standards to allow all these billions of devices to talk together in a common framework, common language, common way. We've done a lot of great work. We have a lot to do. Uh, then we talked about NEC, who shared with us the experience of create a common data platform, the city as a platform, which will enable the data economy. And then we came to you where it was a, a it dive deep into what that means. Grenoble talked about vertical versus horizontal. How do we move from siloed data 
independent uh, driven data into a common and open and shared. Then we moved into, uh, with Citerium, gave us a real example of how we build value in the case of street lighting, city lighting, how do we derive value? And that's interesting because when you think about street lighting, I don't know if you know, but every few hundred meters are provided by a different supplier, different kind of lights. That's a great example of interoperability and the value of data. When you put this data, you can start looking at not only the efficiency, economic saving, but the safety of the people. And then we talked with UBWare, which was, I mean, a lot of case studies that demonstrate the IoT, but one thing he said that's very interesting to me that e exemplifies what we talk about the data economy. When he talked about the environment, he said, we do not want to sell the hardware and the software. We provide insight. That's what we mean by the data economy. That's what we mean the value of the hardware is becoming zero. The value is in the data that you collect through the hardware and you convert into a insight, into value. And then we moved to talk about uh, center of innovation, talked about the value of data lab. Cities are not ready to deal with this data. The role of chief data officer, chief digital officer, whatever equivalent it is in the city, it's emerging. A lot of cities do not have those capabilities. Mm. So how do we help cities into understanding the value and data? And then he talked about the value of technology and unraveling, uncovering insight that was not possible before. One data to AI and technology he talked about. So I, I hope this session, these two hours are worth of, were worth of your time and you understood what we mean by talking about data and the cloud. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.